Hi everybody and welcome back to the Mindful Dancers channel. My name is Karen and for today's video we are going to be doing a discussion video today and it is how to implement the four agreements. This is the book I read um, a couple months ago called The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz and it's how to implement these agreements into your dance classroom. So teachers, this video is for you. So go ahead and grab a cup of coffee um, and a notebook or pen, and let's go ahead and dive right in. Just as I mentioned in the intro, um, I read this book um, a couple months ago, um, The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. Um, and this is a book that talks about four simple agreements um, to follow along um, in order to live your life fully. Um, so for all my dance teachers, if you are um, struggling with implementing organization um, and just really struggling in the dance classroom, um, this book is just for you. And today we are going to be going over these four agreements um, and how you can implement um, them into the classroom. So the first agreement that we are going to dive right into um, is being impeccable with your word. Um, so being impeccable with your word, what does that mean? Well, it can mean a lot of different things depending on the person. So for me, being impeccable with your word um, means keeping promises that you make to your students or anything of that nature. Um, and it is one of the most important, yet the most um, difficult agreement uh, to honor. And sometimes it's very easy to forget this one because we are all human. Um, and especially when we are super burned out um, or just very, very tired, it's easy um, to say a lot of things that we don't necessarily mean. And as dance teachers, we are easily burnt out all the time because we are creating all these lesson plans and you have to keep um, your students in line. And when you are very, very tired and you're very, very burned out, it is very easy to accidentally slip out um, something that you don't really necessarily mean, and that can be very, very tricky. Um, so as a teacher, your word is super powerful because you are in charge of a class and we hold the power to either inspire students or, um, that was my father in the corner, <laughs> um, but we have the power to inspire um, our students, or we also have the power to hurt them as well. So as dance teachers, it is very important that we utilize our word for good and to really um, inspire our students. Um, and there is a quote um, in this book, and I'm going to find it here. Okay, here we go. So it is a quote from page 26 um, of this book here. Um, and this is what it says. So the word is not just a sound or a written symbol, um, but the word is a force. It is the power you have to express and communicate, to think, and thereby to create the events in your life. Um, and then it goes on to say um, that the word is the most powerful tool that you have as a human being and it has the power to create um, or destroy um, everything around you. And there is actually a wonderful example um, in this book and it's actually on page 34 through 36. and. Um, the author talks about this woman um, who had a daughter 
and the daughter really, really loved to sing. Um, so she would, um, you know, sing to her heart's content, um, but the mother um, was really having a rough day and she had a terrible headache um, and she really just wanted uh, some peace and quiet. Um, and the daughter, you know, blissfully unaware of how her mother is feeling and she's just singing and enjoying herself. Um, and then the mother, um, without really meaning it, without really realizing, realizing it, it just slipped out. Um, she basically said, you know, shut up. You, you have an ugly voice. You, you, can you just like shut up for one second? Um, and of course of that really hurt the daughter. And the reason why this is a really good example is because the mother, after saying that, um, you know, she said that, but the daughter was starting to, um, believe what the mother had said about her. And when she grew up, she had this belief that she had a really, really terrible voice and she did not sing for um, the rest of her life after that. So it's a really good example of how your word can is really, really super, super important. Um, so it's a really, really good, and I encourage you to read this book and I'm gonna probably say that a million, million times. Um, but let's go into, a little bit of some examples of being impeccable with your word. So when you're impeccable with your word, it starts with yourself. And there is um, a quote here. It's page 28 in the book here. Yes, it is basically that the human mind, our minds here, um, is like a fertile ground where seeds are continually being planted and the seeds are opinions, ideas, and concepts. You plant a seed, a thought, and it grows. So like the example of the mother and the daughter, when the mother shouted out that the daughter had an ugly voice, the daughter started to believe this and this seed was planted it, it deep into her mind and she started to believe that and it affected her for the rest of her life. So like I said, the human mind is very, very fertile and it molds, yeah? So you can, it, so that's why especially teachers have so much power um, over this. And okay, so being impeccable with your word starts with yourself. I just repeated that um, already. Um, but this is very familiar um, and we can tie this to the yamas and the niyamas. So if um, you watched some of my yamas and niyamas discussion videos when I did um, a workshop series regarding to the yamas and niyamas, um, we talked about ahimsa Ahimsa is the concept of nonviolence. So when you are kind to yourself, you are in turn kind to others. And also satya, which means truthfulness. So when you are truthful with yourself, you can then be truthful with others. It, it ties back in to this as well. Okay, so when you say kind things to yourself, all right, and when you start to accept some your truth, then you can in turn show and express your kindness and your truth to others. So when we use the power of our word to create love and kindness to ourselves, we can do the same to our students. I'm talking to you dance teachers here. Um, and us dance teachers are the harshest critics of ourselves. And I can totally say this from experience. I am very hard on myself. And when, so in turn, we have to turn this around, okay? And speak kind things to ourselves so that we can be there for our students, okay? So that's a little bit of being impeccable with your word. Now, how would we apply this agreement um, into our classroom. Uh, the first thing you can do is to be aware 
of the language you are using when you are correcting students. Now, as dance teachers, it is our job um, to correct a student's form, how to do a certain step, that is our, that is our job. Okay, but we have to be careful in how we are saying said correction to our students. Okay, like example, we're teaching, we're teaching a young student how to point their feet. Okay, instead of saying, oh, you've got like ugly feet. Well, no teacher has ever said to a student that you have ugly feet, but I'm just using this um, as an example. It's, it's a hypothetical example. So if a teacher says that a student has ugly feet, um, the student is probably going to believe, oh, I have ugly feet. And, you know, it's going to be with her or him for the rest of their life. Um, so it is very important that when you are doing corrections, you want to describe how the feeling of doing a tendu or pointing our feet, the feeling of it rather than how it the tendu should look. Does that make sense? Um, so it's all about the feeling of doing said action rather than, oh, is, does your, your feet has to look like a little banana foot type of thing, okay? And feel free to leave any comments, any feedback, any thoughts down below um, if I have missed anything or if you want to add on to our conversation today. So that's the first um, first thing you can apply. Uh, the second thing you can do is when you are promising to students that you will do an activity, either like say, we'll do this activity next week because we don't have time to do it today, please make sure you follow through on it. And, I, and I've actually learned the hard way <laughs> because sometimes my students have called me out on things I have said, but you said you do this. So I, I have been called out quite a bit by my younger students. And so I have learned the hard way. So yeah, follow through on your promises. That's an example of being impeccable with your word is you follow on what you say, you follow through on your promises and your intern, your students are going to respect you. So that is example number two. Uh, the third thing you can do to apply this agreement is being impeccable with your word. It starts not only inside the studio, but outside, okay? So not even in the classroom itself, but outside of the dance studio. So an example would be being careful of how you discuss your students outside of the classroom because, excuse me, um, you might say something that you probably don't like a student and that word can, you know, get back to others and maybe to the mother or the father themselves. Um, and it's going to bite you in the butt. Um, so you really want to be careful of how you are talking about you are, your students and so forth. Um, another thing is referring, you, you know, referring back to being impeccable starts with yourself. So how do you, as a teacher, talk to yourself? Are you very harsh with yourself? Or do you in turn say kind things and um, really care for yourself and that type of stuff? And which leads into the third point, which is taking time to care for yourself because like the concept of ahimsa, when you are kind to yourselves or satya, when you are truthful with yourself, you in turn take that into the studio and to your students. Okay, so that is the first agreement. So being impeccable with your word. Um, the second agreement is to not take anything personally. 
So that means whatever is happening around you, you try not to take it personally. And this is a lot easier said than done. And it is very hard as a dance teacher um, because you are you are the person that is teaching these kids, these students, um, the life skills. You're teaching them life skills through the art of dance. Um, and when you go into uh, the end of the year recital, the recital is mainly a reflection on you. <laughs> <laughs> and we all know this. It's a reflection on how well you taught these students and if these students learned anything. Um, so, yeah, it can be very hard to not take anything personally. Um, and Ruiz talks about this concept of personal importance. And I'm just going to quote it here. It's on page... 40, whoops, 48, yes. So, so on page 48, he says, you take things personally because you agree with whatever was said. As soon as you agree, the poison goes through you and you are trapped in a dream of hell. <laughs> and what causes you to be trapped um, is what we call personal importance. Personal importance or taking things personally is the maximum expression of selfishness because we make the assumption that everything is about me. During our period of our education or our domestication, as he likes to call it, um, we learn to take everything personally. We think we are responsible for everything. Me, 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 always me. Yes, yeah, so in this day and age, we live in a world of individualism. And we always take things personally, no matter what is said about us, what we think is said about us, we always think it's about us. Uh, so when we make assumptions on a situation or things that were said about us, we assume it's about us and accept it to be true and take it personally. And it, like, like I just mentioned earlier. So we are taught to take everything personally. Um, and we usually, it usually depends, um, on our experiences and on our upbringing as well. And we are taught to think we are responsible for everything, especially as dance teachers, because we have certain responsibilities. And by large, we are responsible for these students, for their well-being, for their safety, um, what they are learning in the classroom. That is our responsibility. So we really hold that to heart. And it can be very easy when a parent is angry. It can be very easy to internalize that and take it personally because we think, oh, we did something wrong. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. Um, so anything that a person has said or done um, is, has nothing to do with you most of the time. And I've had to learn this. Um, it is mainly because of themselves, like an experience they had and they reflected back on you. Um, so going into how this agreement can be applied, excuse me, into the classroom. The first example that I can think of, excuse me, and it's a very, um, very, very um, easy uh, example here is when a student drops your class or when they quit dance altogether. And I've had a lot of numerous people dropping um, or quitting a lot last year. Um, that can be very easily to take personally because you are thinking as the teacher, oh no, 
did I do something wrong? Did they not, did they, the student, I mean, not have a good time? Or if a parent is um, giving you feedback, you're going to take that personally like, oh no, I did something wrong. This is all my fault that this student is leaving, okay? But a uh, hundred to 96% of the time, it is nothing to do with you. <laughs> um, so here are a few steps you can take here. If it feels right, you can email the student's parents and ask them, you know, um, I'm sorry to see you go. Um, is there an explanation to your departure? Um, and like I said, it's oftentimes not a reflection on you, um, but mainly it's because the student is interested um, in other activities or they have so much on their plate that they have to drop one activity so that the student, the child can do another. That is one of the main reasons why some kids drop dance altogether or quit your class altogether. It usually has nothing to do. And the best thing to not, you know, make assumptions and take things personally is to basically just email the parent and ask is always the best um, solution to that. Um, the second example is when the student is in a really bad mood you are going to run into these students with moods like no tomorrow. <laughs> and I've encountered, I haven't had too much of these, thank goodness. Um, but I have encountered this my, I think my first year um, teaching at um, my, the current studio I'm at right now. Um, it is usually a reflection on how the student is feeling and what kind of day they had before they came into your class. It is literally not always about you. I'm gonna be blunt, it's not always about you. Um, so maybe they had a bad day at school. Maybe things are bad at home. You know, we do not know. So, and yet as teachers, we, we sometimes like to take things personally and we think, oh no, the student is in a really bad mood. It's my fault because I'm not making it fun for them or they're not making it fun for the students. And that's my fault, that sort of thing. Um, the best solution is to basically show them a little bit of grace. You know, if it feels, if it feels right, you can pull them aside and say, hey, I understand what you're going through. It's okay. As long as said student is not being a disruption to the class and not making the whole experience not fun for the students, like the whole students in general, then show them a little bit of grace because maybe they are having not such a good day or things have happened at home. And of course that's none of our business, but just show them a little bit of grace and you can reassure them that, you know, it's okay to have bad days um, and everything's gonna be okay. Just as long as they are not making the experience of dance hard for all the other students that are there and they're not disrupting class. So that is the second agreement. So we have two more agreements uh, to go through here. And the third one is to not make assumptions. And this kind of ties in with don't take things personally because when we take things personally, we make assumptions and it's a little pattern. So the main problem with this is we tend to believe whatever assumptions we make are true. And I am the queen of assuming everything. Um, and I actually made a little circle here. I've got my outline here, but I actually made a little diagram of how um, assumptions work. So this is the cycle of assumptions here. I'm gonna see if I can get up here, okay? So first, 
we make the assumption, okay? When we make this set assumption, it's going to, we start to take it personally, okay? And then when we take this assumption personally, we start to blame ourselves, we start to react, and it turns into words of poison. And then the cycle continues, okay? So it's this big, big circle of assumptions, taking things personally, and then we either blame ourselves or somebody else, and we start to react to it with either saying or blurting out words that we do not mean and so forth. So it's a pretty bad cycle. So all of this stems from a fear of asking for clarification and the need to justify everything and explain and understand everything. And it is a safety mechanism, okay? It's a safety mechanism because we need to have an answer for everything so that we as humans can feel safe. Does that make sense? And again, feel free to leave any um, thoughts or feedback in the comments if you have more to add on, okay? So that is how the cycle of assumptions works. So how can we apply not making assumptions in the classroom? Well, the best way is if you do not understand something as a teacher or even as a student, I'm also talking to you students as well. If you do not understand something, the best way, and it is very, very hard for someone who's an introvert, is to ask questions. Ask questions. It sounds easy, but it I understand it can be very, very hard. So best way is to ask questions and you have to find your voice to ask for what you want. Again, easier said than done. You can all you also need to ask and be clear. Okay? When we start to ask questions, when we start to find our voice, and when we state our clear intentions, then we can have, <clears throat> we can find the correct answers and it breaks the cycle of assumption making pretty much. And again, that, that's the, the short of it and it's, it's easier said than done. Um, so now we are moving into the fourth and final agreement. Okay, and that is always do your best. I kind of like this one. Um, so always do your best, no matter what is going on in your personal life right now, no matter what the circumstances are, you always, always, always do your best, especially with implementing these agreements, you always do your best. But we must be mindful that your best is going to be different every single day. You're not always gonna give your 100%. Maybe you give your 70% and that is your best. Maybe on another day, you give your 100% and then another day it's going to be 50% and that's going to be your best. And this can apply to not only us dance teachers, but it can also apply to students as well. So it is very, very, very important to do your best. And these first three agreements that we just talked about are only going to work if you do your absolute best. Okay, so that is how to implement the four agreements into your dance classroom. I really hope this was helpful for you and I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this video. If you did, thumbs up the video um, and make sure you subscribe to the channel and click the notifications bell so that you can be notified of videos that I post. Um, and uh, like I said, feel free to leave any feedback if you have any questions or any other extra comments that I may have missed uh, down below. I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions. Even if you don't agree with me, I'd like to hear what you guys have to say. Um, and aside from that, I will go ahead and talk to you guys in the next video. Bye, everybody. Bye.